Welcome to three innovations that redefine data protection for Amazon S3. Uh, my name is Woon Jung. I'm the co-founder and CTO of Kumio. Today with me, I have Peter Yiming, Hello. Principal Product Manager from Thanks. Amazon S3, and Mark Hoover, Senior Director of Engineering at Cox Automotive. Uh, first, I'll have uh, Peter join me to talk about how S3 is being used and why you should protect the data in your S3 buckets. And then after that, I'll have Mark join me to talk about their journey in their AWS and the partnership with Clumio. Last, I'll come in and talk about kind of the details about the, how things are implemented in the back end, and I'll give you a live demo that I'm pretty sure that you all like it. Peter? Thanks, Moon. Uh, so if you thought this was data protection for security or IAM or encryption, this is not the session for you. Uh, we're going to be talking a lot about data protection in terms of backup in terms of replication and high availability, durability, availability. So if the, you're in the wrong session, uh, definitely now's the time to, to head on out. Uh, but again, I think we want to say thank you for coming to the session. We know you had a lot of choices out there for different sessions to attend, including uh, the bar sessions out there right now. So thank you all, I think, from our perspective for, for coming here and listening to us today. Uh, we'll try and keep it as interactive as possible. If you have questions, I think we're all comfortable taking questions uh, as you might have them. So we'll go ahead and, and get started here and, and talk about uh, data protection for S3. Now, Amazon S3, we really have come a long way in 16 years with Amazon S3. We're now storing over 280 trillion objects in S3, uh, over 100 million transactions per second. And really what we're seeing S3 kind of transform into is really uh, now the production, the primary production storage for customers to create new data in. It's no longer just a place to, to store data or backup data to. Uh, in my time at AWS, I've been there for three years on S3, that's probably the biggest transformation I've seen is that we now have uh, the primary, the bulk of the data coming into S3 being natively created inside of AWS. And this is really a, a, a change over the last couple of years that we've just seen accelerate. And that comes from applications that you're running, such as data lakes, machine learning. Uh, it could be EMR, it could be our services, it could be uh, uh, Datadog, Databricks, it could be Snowflake DB. You're starting to see now S3 and object storage really become the primary de facto class of storage that you're creating new content within. And that includes cloud native applications that you may be running in a container that could be classic virtual machines that are now writing out to object storage directly. It could be new databases that are gonna be shipping from traditional database vendors that are gonna now run natively on object storage for the first time in their long history. And we're also seeing, obviously, a tremendous growth in log files, machine-generated log files, machine-generated data, everything from IP cameras, everything from factory sensors that are all generating machine logs and then rapidly sending those to S3 as the production storage. And we take that very seriously at Amazon. So when we've got 280 trillion objects to store, that takes a lot of effort to store durably, to store with availability, to store with redundancy. And we take that very seriously. And if you've ever had to manage storage at scale, you understand that that takes a lot of work to manage all three of those for virtually, essentially, unlimited scale. So we wake up every day on S3 and go look after the availability, durability, and the resiliency of that data, of those 280 trillion objects, so that you don't have to. You don't have to worry that your data is durably stored. You can go take that time now back and go innovate on top of S3, rather than having to craft durable storage that's highly available. When we look at S3, there are, though, a different type of data protection question that we get today, and that is a delete request. We don't know customer intent when you ask us to delete an object. We have to look at that request as unambiguous. We don't know if it's accidental. We don't know if it's intentional. We don't know if it's perhaps even malicious. So when we have that type of application data, whether it's user-generated data, media configuration data, again, we talked about the data lakes, sensitive information, all of this different data has different value to your organization. And what we're looking at here is 
different layers of data protection on top of different types of data. And what I'll be talking about before handing it off to Mark is really kind of looking at the different layers of data protection that are most appropriate for the different types of data that you're storing in S3 today. If that's compliance data, that's going to require a different level of protection than what you might have for uh, user data that might be uploaded. Cat.jpg, right? How many of, of, of copies of cat.jpg do we need to store? That's a very different type of data to protect than data that contains payment card information, HIPAA data, personally identifiable information. So this is the type of data that we're storing. This is the type of data that you're storing in S3, I should say. And so what we're going to be talking about today is kind of crafting the right layers of protection on top of S3 and how you can set that up for the right types of data that you're storing. When we look at the types of risks that you have in S3, the difference versus traditional storage that you may have been running for the last 10, 20 years is that you no longer have to worry about, again, the durability and the physical access to the storage. It's now about an API. It's that request to delete data. Again, we don't know what the intent is of that request, but we do know, and it's important to S3, that we honor that request. So whether that's a human error, whether that's an inadvertent deletion, mistakes happen. Is it a natural disaster? Is it a fire, a flood? Is it Godzilla coming in and wrecking some undersea communication cables? At the end of the day, these are all things to consider when we're talking about your data stored in S3. Again, the deletions though, those are really what we're gonna kind of focus on today for the most part. Software errors, whether it's a human or a piece of software, if it's a script, maybe it's a lifecycle policy that's been misconfigured. Again, we cannot distinguish between a correct deletion and an incorrect deletion. We have to honor that request, just as we honored the request to put data into S3. So when we look at that, we now have accidental data loss, we have software errors, and we also have what we call bad actors. These could be employees that have, again, authorization to the data through our access controls, our IAM policies, but their intent as a bad actor is to do something malicious with that data. Again, we can't differentiate between their delete request and a properly authorized delete request that's not coming from a bad actor. So we have to look at all of these possibilities and then offer additional layers of protection inside of S3. And that's really where this kind of, it looks like an everlasting gobstopper type approach here, but your data is at the center. And the first layer of protection that we always talk about is, again, your access controls. S3 by default is secure. You're not gonna access that data unless you have been authorized through IAM. Now, when we look at that though, if you are properly authorized, once you've got access to the data, what can you do with it? An accidental deletion, again, is no different to S3 than a malicious deletion. We can't distinguish between the two. So that's really where something like object versioning is the beginning of that journey, where you can now set S3 to go ahead and start preventing accidental deletions by keeping every version that is created. Is it an overwrite? We will create a new version. Is it the deletion? We will then put a deletion marker as the current version in your S3 version object stack. We keep track of every single version. We always essentially append in object versioning once that's enabled on your bucket. From there, we then need to talk about malicious deletions. So we've got accidental deletions covered. What about malicious deletions? Malicious deletions, that is the layer that we then bring to bear. This is, again, an opt-in feature called object lock. And object lock really has become sort of a de facto standard for immutable storage in the cloud. Object lock can be enabled at the bucket level or a per object level. And once you have an object lock placed on an object, it's a retain until date, that object cannot be deleted by AWS personnel, it cannot be deleted by your root account. So we can now prevent even malicious bad actors from coming in and performing a, a, an intentional delete, even though they're properly authorized through IAM policies. We'll also be talking a little bit about replication. Now, if you need to prevent, uh, and, and essentially, if you need to have that data available for compliance reasons or have that data, will, data available in a different region for resiliency, that's where S3 replication comes in. 
Now, replication is there. It's not going to be a backup. It's not going to be centrally managed or independent from S3. So when we look at all three of these here, object versioning, object lock, and replication, these are all opt-in features that you have to turn on in S3. They are not necessarily centrally managed. They are enabled essentially per bucket inside of S3. Now, to look at all of that together, Mark's going to be talking a little bit about another feature that we launched that's one of my favorite things to talk about called S3 Storage Lens. It gives you a bird's eye view, a central view of all of those features and essentially what percentage of your data is versioned, what percentage of your data is object locked, what percentage of your data is replicated. And Storage Lens is something that you can actually get up and running uh, by dinner tonight. It has 14 days of historical data ready to go. Mark's going to show you how Cox Automotive uses it. But it gives you a, a bird's eye view of all three of those data protection capabilities. But what we've talked about so far is all native to S3. But mistakes, again, still happen. None of those are a replacement for a true traditional backup that is independent and centrally managed. And that's really where we talk about solutions with partners such as Clumio. And that's where we'll be talking about Cox Automotive's journey with Mark here today about why they chose Clumio to supplement those existing data protection features that they're already using in S3, but why Cox wanted to, to cover that specifically and look at a solution like Clumio to actually create an independent backup copy of S3. Mark. All right, thanks, Peter. Yep. All right, my name is Mark Huber. Uh, I am the uh, Director of Engineering Enablement at Cox Automotive. Um, so Cox Automotive, who are we? Um, not maybe a, a household name that you would know, but you probably know some of our, our uh, public faces, like autotrader.com and Kelly Blue Book. Um, you look see all those logos across the bottom, there's 20 more that you probably have never heard of, unless you're in the automotive industry, and that's where we are. We are on a mission to transform the way the world buys, sells, owns, and uses vehicles. If you've really kind of paid attention to what's going on in the industry in the last five years, we're seeing a whole new model, not the classic model of going out and buying a car at your local dealership, uh, everything you see from ride share to uh, fleet rental. Um, it's, it's completely changing the dynamics of the automotive industry and Cox Automotive is there leading uh, the charge in how the industry operates, how people access transportation, um, whether it's clean energy um, and, and green vehicles, or uh, how they uh, use and lease vehicles, not a month by a time, but maybe hour at a time. Um, we're looking at all the new ways that the automotive industry is starting to think about how we utilize vehicles. In doing that, we have come to, we're actually, you may not know this, the Cox organization is over 120 years old, originally started in the newspaper industry, and we've evolved through many different parts. You see Cox out here, that's Cox Communication, one of our sister organizations, um, and we're in many other parts of the uh, industries as well. Cox Automotive has come together probably over more of the last 50 years. And we are uh, really a, an aggregation of many teams all over the United States, all over uh, North America, South America, all over the world internationally, right? And so that has come together over so many years. You remember, you know, everyone knows Kelly Blue Book remembers the actual book, right? How long has that been around? That's us, right? And we've evolved that into kbb.com, instant cash offer, these things you see today. Behind the scenes, that's over 500 software engineering teams that have come together to start collaborating more as one engineering organization. That's a journey that we've been on. And we've been a journey to the cloud into AWS for approximately the last seven years. And I've had the pleasure of being a part of that exercise of bringing disparate engineering teams together, right? To operate more as one engineering organization to fulfill that vision and mission of Cox Automotive. In doing that, we've brought a lot of software along the way um, to operate more as, as one engineering ecosystem, modernizing and making more cloud-native applications, moving from on-premise data center environments, mainframe systems, up into systems now based in Amazon S3, Lambda, 
using DynamoDB, right? We have an internal initiative called Serverless First, right? And really driving the change the way we build and architect software. But not just which technologies we use. About four years ago, we made a big shift in focus and adopted the AWS well-architected framework as really sort of our guide stone for how do we think about what does good software look like? The pillars of operational excellence, security, reliability, performance, cost, and now sustainability really shape the way we look at what does a good, well-architected piece of software look like? And we've used that as a, as a benchmark for all of these different teams, all these different software systems, and now deploying all of that software in over 1,300 AWS accounts. Um, that's really allowed us to come from sort of all walks of engineering life, all different engineering cultures, and start to operate more like one engineering organization, right? And that's been our journey, that's been our story, uh, and I've had the pleasure to be a part of that, so. Data is a huge part of what makes that mission and that journey a, a, a possible reality. You know, we got some numbers up on here, and these are pulled from storage lens, like Peter was talking Ooh. about, okay? I have the, uh, you know, the, the line of sight over those 1,300 AWS accounts to look at our data real estate at scale, right? We store close to 20 petabytes in S3 across those 1,300 accounts. That is across those accounts. That's not 20 petabytes in one bucket. That's not 20 petabytes in one account. That's 20 petabytes spread across 1,300 AWS accounts, spread across over 33,000 different buckets. That's 153 billion objects. It is, G's a, G in this slide is a B, so <laughs> that's billions. So we are, one tiny little drop in that bucket of, no pun intended, of 280 trillion objects stored in S3. We appreciate that, Mark. <laughs> the average object size is 142 kilobytes, right? How could I even begin to understand that and wrap my head around that without the tool sets that Storage Lens gives me to understand how those 500 different Scrum teams are building software and operating on data? Um, the ability first to just understand your estate is where we started because 10 years ago, I can't say that we did understand our estate. Moving to the cloud, using tools like S3 and Storage Lens has, has made it possible to just begin to even understand what that looks like. Um, now, I know, Peter, you just had a, a launch of some new features with Storage Lens. I, I'll confess, I haven't even had a chance to read the blog post yet. Do you want to talk a little bit about some of the new metrics that have come out? Sure. Thanks, Mark. So. 34 new metrics in Storage Lens. I think I have that right. Uh, 34 new metrics. And again, the, the beauty of Storage Lens is you can get it up and running in just a matter of minutes. All those dashboards are ready to go with those metrics with 14 days of historical data. So if you're not using Storage Lens today, that would be my, my one ask is look at Storage Lens and then look at enabling object versioning. Now I'm going to sit down and <laughs> end the commercial. But, Thank well, you. no, and, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a good commercial, right? But that is actually a true story for us, right? Um, so getting into talking about, you know, how we started talking about a backup strategy, right? Those hundreds of teams are, are doing their local backup strategy, right? They have operational backups. They're thinking about what happens in the event of a disaster, right? But we started really doing some threat modeling to understand some of these more nefarious uh, scenarios like ransomware. And, uh, you know, the starting question was, well, how much data do we even have that we have to even be concerned about? Um, and it was, someone asked me a question and I went scrambling for an answer. And a couple hours later, we turned on storage lens at the organization's level and we had starting dashboards right out of the box and helped me start thinking about how to organize a backup strategy. Um, very quickly, we got into that backup strategy and we came to a couple of interesting conclusions. Cox Automotive is not trying to transform the way the world backs up data. That's what Peter does. That's what Woon is doing, right? We are trying to transform the automotive industry. It's not our core competency. We did actually briefly have the conversation about should we build this ourselves, right? Maybe we could build this, but it's not what we're here to do. 
So we like to partner with organizations like Clumio to bring them waking up every morning thinking about that problem, about how to maximize the efficiency of a backup, right? And we partner with them so that we can focus on our core competency, right? The ransomware risks are real. You, you read what's going on in the industry. Um, we ran a lot of threat scenarios internally and saw that this was a real potential risk. Our AWS multi-account strategy running across 1,300 accounts really helps mitigate that risk. But that wasn't enough, because it only takes one account on that critical public-facing property uh, to you know, put you on the headlines of the Wall Street Journal. Right? Um, it's a very complex problem, technically speaking. It, we, you know, we did the simple math. We did the simple way of thinking about it. We have 20 petabytes of data, and it costs us this much. We need to back it all up. So are we going to spend twice as much in what we're doing, the simple backup strategies would say yes, right? What we saw with Clumio was that they thought about that problem a lot harder that we, than we had. And the results we're getting with Clumio um, in the efficiencies, even in the dollar, in how we are approaching our backup strategy now change that 2x dynamic. It's not like that, right? Thinking about when we first met Clumio, when I first met Woom, um, what we saw was exceptional competency uh, in, in the space of data and thinking about how to handle and manage data, right? Um, the things that Woon's going to show in the demo in a bit, the way that they manage uh, Clumio partitions, the way they think about reorganizing data for optimal storage and cost efficiency in it, is something that we had never even considered, right? And here's the more important part. It was simple to use, right? Part of the, the hardest thing I have to focus on when thinking about a backup strategy is bringing those 500 teams together and getting them to take an action, right? Getting them to put a story in their backlog, right? Getting them to all collectively focus on and engage in a backup strategy. Whatever we brought them, it had to be simple. It had to solve our problems around needing a truly air-gapped solution uh, for, for, the, for that ransomware scenario. That was what kicked off our focus on, on data. Now, air-gapped is a word that's been around our industry probably for 30 plus years, right? It's, it's this very traditional idea of no wires connecting these two environments, right? No way in or out. Someone, you know, uh, compromises your, your operational environment, there's no way that they can compromise your data vault environment. And that's important. It's an important component of our strategy to mitigate the risk around a ransomware event. But there's a, there's a, as we looked at solutions, there's a tough part of that. Many of the ways of doing that take it outside the four walls of AWS. It, take, it takes it outside the technology that gives us the durability and the resiliency guarantees, traditionally speaking, right? We didn't want to lose the benefits of how we store and manage data in S3 in our own accounts when working with a backup solution. And so we very specifically went searching for a partner who was focused in natively developing air gap style technologies working inside the AWS ecosystem. And that's what we found when we looked at Clumio. It had to perform when we're talking about this much backup at this much scale. These are running operational systems with very tight RTO and RPO concerns. We need to make sure that we can get those levels of return to operation and recovery point without impacting 24 seven running production workloads. And finally, we needed good partners, right? And this is probably the, the most important part to us, right? When we first met the Clumio team, it did not do everything that we needed it to do, right? It didn't work the way we needed it to work to easily roll it out to 500 teams across 1,300 accounts. So we partnered, and we worked closely with their team, worked personally with Woon, worked with much of the Clumio team here today, and very rapidly we innovated. They understood our problem, they understood our objectives, and they shaped their product quickly, 
And I can tell you working with other partners quickly is not always the operative word in that sentence, right? So that partnership, thank you. Thank you to the Clumio team, right? It's been excellent, okay? So what are the results of all of this? We've been working with them for you know, roughly the past year. We've been able to standardize a data protection capability in over 1,300 accounts, right? I talked about that well-architected framework and the idea of workloads. These are all the different collective software systems that we have. Based on something we call our core program, which is Cox Automotive's Observability and Resiliency Engineering Program, we've been able to rate those 600 workloads to understand which of them are most critical for these resiliency capabilities, the first in the line to be backed up to have full ransomware protection. And that's made us a real actionable game plan to start rolling out the technology to these workloads in the accounts. We work with the Clumio team to develop a Terraform provider. We Terraform all 1,300 AWS landing zones in those accounts. And so now our provisioning process that provisions a new account, we do that on a multiple times a week. Every single account comes fully integrated with the Clumio stack. We use a tagging strategy developed with, um, to match the protection group patterns within Clumio. That means it's as simple for a team as putting a tag on a bucket to start backing up. No plugging in the tool, no integrating, no setup. They simply drop a tag and it starts backing up. And that was the kind of simplicity that we were looking for. Right? The, way we, the way that Clumio looks at cost in their credit system allows us to consume as we go and clearly track which teams are consuming how much of the backup capacity. Right? It makes us effective in that cost pillar in the well-architected framework, really to understand how that money's being spent, not spend and waste while the product sits on a shelf, but buy as we go and buy as we need, and that's been great. Yeah. Um, and we've developed a lot of new interesting features with them, especially around that last one, BYOK, bring your own key. Talked about that native part of, of a solution working within the AWS space working directly with AWS KMS, right? We are able to mutually share a pair of KMS keys, one owned by Cox Automotive, one owned by Clumio, which makes sure the right level of balance, the idea that I can take my critical data and put it in the hands of a trusted partner like Clumio, but still have the power to have control while it's left my four walls to shut down the access to that data by revoking that encryption key. Patterns like that developed mutually give us the right balance where I can trust what is a, an outside entity to handle my most sensitive and critical data. So I'm gonna tell, I'm gonna stop there, I'm gonna hand it over to Woon, and he's gonna show us how the magic happens. Thank you. So let's start with uh, what's Clumio. So Clumio is a data protection service created on AWS to support the workloads and data sources running on AWS. To that end, we wanted to create a service that is as scalable and elastic as all the data services and applications that you're running on the public cloud on AWS. Before I jump in, I just want to share a few uh, observations that makes data protection for S3 so challenging. Like Peter mentioned, S3 is being used very widely because of the flexibility, simplicity, scalability, performance, and then the various point of integration makes S3 a natural choice when it comes to be the application primary data store, especially for those modern applications that were actually born in the cloud. What that means to us is that now we have buckets where objects are being created by hundreds of thousands, if not by millions. They're always they're created per hour. We also see buckets that are huge. They contain easily one, two billions of objects Moreover, we have customers coming to us with 10, 20, 30 billions of objects per bucket. We also see a lot of variety because of the different use cases. They have data with different characteristics and different requirements. Let me just give you one example. Let's say you have a bucket with one billion objects. I'm pretty sure that within that bucket, you will have some objects that you probably don't care backing them up. But you will have another subset of the objects that you are required to keep a second copy and you want to retain it for one year. 
Even more, you may have another subset of objects within the same, back, uh, within the same bucket that you would like to back it up, and this time you want to retain it for seven years. And we wanted to create a service that is as flexible so that you can actually satisfy all the compliance requirements and at the same time optimize the cost by not do backing up what you don't need to. While looking at all of these things, you see that it is very hard for a single solution to be the magic bullet that solves all of the problems. Another example is depending on the use cases and how you use your buckets, many times it is not ideal or very practical for enabling things like object locking. And at Clumio, what we try to do is to create a service, another tool in your tool arsenal, in your toolbox, along the features that uh, Peter talked about earlier, which you can use and achieve data protection for your data in S3. All right, so I'm going to start with the high-level uh, level architecture overview, and then we'll keep going down the road. First of all, on the left-hand side, we have Agni. It's a hypothetical, hypothetical customer, and they're looking to protect that big bucket in the middle. The way that in, they install Clumio is by deploying a CloudFormation template or a Terraform. Once that CloudFormation template is deployed, we go ahead and install an IAM role and an event bridge. That's all. In your account, the only Clumio footprint is literally just that role and that event bridge. While that is getting deployed, on Clumio's side, we actually go ahead and create a dedicated AWS account for the customer Agni. The way that we segregate data across the customer is by actually creating dedicated AWS accounts for every customer that onboards with Clumio. And Woon, I'll, I'll, I'll say, there was, there was hesitation with the idea of moving data into your platform because it could be co-mingled with other customers. The, you are using the same pattern that we use to create segmentation, to create isolation for Cox Automotive's data separate from your other customers, right? And still get all the perimeter security, right, that it gives in isolation. So this was a game changer that made our, many parts of our organization mm -hmm. much more comfortable with the idea of working with a third party for, for data backup. Yes, a lot of the things that we do is really security first. Yeah. And all the access that happens from the Clumio side back to the customer accounts is really through that IAM role. And we will use that event bridge to capture the changes that are happening in the, bu in the, in the bucket that we're backing up. And we're also integrating with S3 inventory to capture the catalog of the objects that you have in that bucket. And then as you can see, and then a lot of the data processing happens through Lambda functions that they all run on our side of the account. Everything starting from data movement, verification, optimizations, and indexing. As you can see, a lot of the complexity is on the Clumio side, and that's by design. We want to deliver Clumio as a service. To that end, we want to keep everything that is complicated to our end and leave the customer side of the, the account pretty simple. Just that role and, a, and an event bridge. And it's worth pointing out, that means near zero operational cost. Our AWS bill, we see near zero cost for you operating within our accounts. Right. The compute right, resides with you, and we buy right. credits from you. Correct. All the patching, troubleshooting, all the observability is actually built right there in our side. All right, so let's talk about a little bit about backup and you know, a little bit about the flexibility as a what to backup, right? We want to optimize costs for our customers, and one of the easiest ways to do it is to allow the customers to tell us what's important to them. What we allow you to do is to specify a set of filters. You tell us what prefix, what timestamps, and what storage classes that you want to back up. And this is the way that you optimize both for cost and also for time that it takes us to do the backup. Because again, given a bucket with a billion objects, you may not want to back up everything. Conceptually, it's pretty simple. You take a long list of objects and you apply a lambda function that goes ahead and applies those filter functions. And then it outputs another smaller, shorter list that contains the list of objects that passes the filter. We also validate the inventory on a daily basis. Remember, we're actually doing continuous backup. We're integrating with EventBridge, and that's how we know when objects are being created or deleted. But we want to make sure that the backup really captures 100% of all the objects that you have. If for whatever reason were to drop one message, 
means that that one message or that one object never gets backed up because we are doing continuous backups based on that event. What we want to do is to actually go ahead and check, cross-check against the S3 inventory on a daily basis, and then detect if there's any objects that are missing. We'll go ahead and do what's called a catch-up backup or fixed backup to make sure that everything is, is captured. In other words, a backup that captures 99.99% .99 of your objects, it is still a failed backup. You do want your backup software to capture well 100% of the objects. The way that we achieve this is that we developed a, a technology that we allow us to compare the catalog of the objects that we have in our backup against the S3 inventory. We will actually diff two lists, and then we will detect whether there's a missing object. And if there is one, it will output, again, a shorter list, which it will be a shorter list, and it will actually do the fake uh, uh, close backup based on that shorter list. Again, think about it. The chances of dropping that event is very small. It will actually be 0.001%. But if you have 10 billion objects, that actually is a decent number. And again, conceptually, things are very simple. But if you're processing tens of billions of objects, it's not so easy. Because even the list of objects, they're terabytes in size. And then we need to run those filters concurrently using multiple Lambda functions at the same time so that we can actually perform backups in a timely manner. Moreover, comparing a very long list of objects is, again, very, very challenging. If you have two lists with 30 billion objects on each side and finding which one is missing, it's actually very, very challenging to do. Some of the technologies that we built here also allow us to support and do backups in buckets that do not have versioning enabled, for instance. Because again, it may not be the most practical things to do in some cases. Let's talk about ingest. So now we know that we collected, we have the list of objects that needs to be backed up, right? So how hard could it be? You know that the objects are organized in prefix, and all we need to do is to actually fire up a bunch of, a bunch of lambda functions and get the objects from one side and move them to the other side, right? Actually, it turns out to be that it's not that easy. If you fire up all those Lambda functions and they all start working on the same prefix or partition, you're going to get a lot of API throttle. You can increase the Lambda functions, but you're not going to make things any faster. In fact, all you're going to get is just API throttles. So what we ended up doing is that we introduced a notion of clone your partition. We're looking at the list of objects that needs to be backed up, and based on some heuristics, we determine the Clumio side of partition. And we actually schedule the Lambda functions across the different partitions. What that allows us to do is now we can actually have these Lambda functions working on different parts of the key space without, without choking a single prefix. But again, at the same time, remember, we're not the only one using that bucket. We're a backup. There's the primary application that is currently using that bucket. And we're continuously monitoring API throttle. And if we see that we're actually getting API throttles, it could be because the primary application is using it, we go ahead and reschedule things. What that means is that we can actually give a little bit of a break to that blue partition out there, and while we actually do a little bit more work on that yellow partition. And we continuously do that as part of the backup so that we can actually satisfy the backup performance and at the same time allow the primary workload to actually have enough uh, requests per second to carry out the work. And that's for, I'll say, that was one of our early concerns, right? There, mm -hmm. there would be no worse outage bridge to be on to say, you know, our software is down because the backup is running, right? right? And to have, a, have it intelligently understand our workload, right, and adjust accordingly right. removes the need for us to have that, you know, to factor in that concern. We no longer think about, well, I have to schedule these at 3 a.m. when my right. workload is low, right, because right. we're competing for resources. Remember, S3 is being used as the primary data store. So you have the application that is continuously reading and writing to that bucket. And if the backup comes in and it takes up all the APIs, all the, all the provisioned APIs, then yes, we can't do that. So we allow you to, you know, we monitor the API throttle, we reschedule things, we allow the customers to even specify what is the maximum allowed uh, API rate that we're allowed to consume. So let's talk about restore. It's very similar to the backups out of the house. Again, we're super focused in actually optimizing things for our customers. And the way that you do that is to actually restore only what you need. 
Like if you, are, if you have 10 billions of objects backed up in Kumio, restoring all that, it does take time. And it is actually time consuming and resource cons consuming. The best way to actually avoid that is to restore exactly what you need. You can restore objects by prefix. You can restore objects based on specific timestamps, tags. There's a variety of the filters that you can specify. And we will only restore those objects that are required. This allows you to actually restore the objects that you need right now and restore some of the other objects at a later point in time. The way that we achieve that is to basically working through the metadata. For every object that we back up, we maintain a metadata entry for every object. For every metadata block, we actually maintain the metadata in parquet files, and we heavily use AWS Athena to query that metadata engine. We know that Athena behaves better if you have metadata objects that are somewhat bigger in the order of hundreds of megabytes. So what we do in the back end is that using various Lambda functions, we're continuously optimizing that metadata payload. We're combining the parquet files. We're actually partitioning them differently so that when it is time to query, it is actually readily available. And we can return that list of objects to be restored very, very quickly. And that's something that we continuously do in the back end uh, for our customers. If you see, these are all challenges that happen when you have a lot of objects. And things are you know, many, many times you don't think about it when you start thinking about implementing your own. So let's talk about observability. I mentioned that we are a service. right? We want to own all the complexity ourselves because we don't want to give it to you. We want to be the ones that detects the failure. We want to be the ones that troubleshoots every failure. We want to be the one that monitors and actually patches everything for you so that you don't have to do anything. You just use it as a service. But at the same time, I just mentioned that I, we use thousands of Lambda functions of different sizes and types. And at the same time, we also have hundreds of customers, meaning hundreds of AWS accounts. And all of these Lambda functions, they're running across all of these 100 AWS accounts. And we have backups continuously happening all over the place. So how do we control all this? Because if something fails, how do we know? Because remember, we need to be the one that detects a failure, and we need to be the one that troubleshoots it and fix it so that you don't have to. For us to achieve this, we actually implemented an internal framework that we call a Clumio Workflow Engine. So for the sake of time, I'm not going to be able to spend too much time on it, but I promise I'll actually give a live demo of this, and I'll show you how it works in real life. I want to talk a little bit about you know, cost optimizations and also some of the confusions and questions that I get from our customers. A lot of the time, I get questions about, you know, this is great, but it looks very expensive. And I also get questions, how is this different from replication? Is this replication? So to answer that question, let me just use an analogy. I'm a big fan of books. Let's say you have a bookshelf full of books. And the way you organize your books is basically based on how you would actually access those books every day. Now, let's say we need to create a second copy or create a backup of those books that you have at home. One way to do that is to actually buy an exact same looking bookshelf and replicate the format to the second bookshelf. Sure, you will end up having two copies and two books. However, if what you're looking is backup, I'll argue that is not the best way to actually achieve backup. If you want to back it up and what you truly want is backup, the best way and the most efficient way to do it is to buy a box, stack all of those books, and put that box away in the storage. That is, the most, that is a more efficient way to actually to do backups. Just like replication is not, you know, just like backup cannot be a replication, replication is not an ideal backup solution either. So it is, again, the right tool for the right problem. Right. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to very quickly go over three announcements, and then we'll actually switch it over to the live demo. So the first one uh, is about 15-minute RPO. I'm actually super happy to announce that we fully, uh, with the help with the S3 folks, we finished fully integrating with the event bridge that allow us to support 15-minute RPO. What we do is that we actually perform 15-minute micro backups. So every 15 minutes, we will actually go and capture those objects, and we'll back it up. And then, just like I told you before, every day, once we receive the daily S3 inventory, 
we will actually cross-examine all of the micro backups that we took in the last 24 hours, and we will actually compare it with the S3 inventory. And if there's anything missing, we will at that point do what we call the close backup and fix everything up so that you do have the guarantee that we capture all of the objects. What this means to you is that it means that in the worst case, you're losing up to 15 minutes worth of data in your bucket once this is enabled. Next, with a lot of the op data optimization, and the partitioning, and the scheduling, we can now support up to 30 billion objects per bucket. What this means to you is that if you have a large bucket and you're struggling with data protection, come talk to us. OK, this last one is something that is actually my favorite one. We're talking about instant access. Clumium, we're actually very, very motivated to actually optimize cost and performance for our customers. Now, if you want to restore a billion objects, what do you do? The first thing that you could do is apply filter and reduce that object counts down. That's one way to do that. But at the end of the filter, if you're left still with hundreds of millions of objects, restoring that, it will actually take time. It will take time and resources. And what we wanted to do is for some specific cases, such as DR testing, backup testing, or true emergency, we wanted to make the data readily available and also at a fraction of the cost. The way we do that is by a feature called instant access, where we expose the data that we store in the backup directly. So we exposed an S3 endpoint that is S3 compatible that you have the backup data there. So for example, we can take a backup or a specific prefix back, let's say, six hours ago. And we will return back to you an S3 endpoint. If you actually connect to that S3 endpoint, it will contain all the objects in that bucket of prefix as of uh, six hours ago. If you want it to be as of three hours ago, we can repeat the same thing. We can actually take you back to any point in time, and we can actually share an S3 endpoint that contains all the data at that specific point in time. And we can do all this at a fraction of the cost and nearly instantaneously. Now, if you're doing things like DR testing, backup testing, or you're in a true emergency, this is something that could really be a life changer for you. All right, we'll do the demo. By the way, it's a live demo. All right, so what I'm going to do is, first of all, I'm going to log into my uh, test cluster. Got all my passwords there. So this is kind of the, the home screen that you greeted on once you log in. We have the very, oops, what happened? <laughs> we have the various dashboards and stuff, but again, for the sake of this discussion, since you were talking about uh, data protection, it was quickly skip over, but this is, kind of gives you a dashboard, a visibility into what's happening on your environment in terms of what's protected, what's protected, how much is costing you, and so on and so forth. Uh, one of the first things that you would have to do is to actually register your environment. Like I mentioned, you can actually do it through a CloudFormation template or via Terraform. Once you register that environment, essentially you specify the AWS account and a region and an optional name, and it will actually, the whole thing will take you no more than 15 minutes to get up and running. Because all we're doing, again, is creating that role and that event bridge on your account. Once that's done, typically what you do is that you create a policy. Uh, you name it and essentially, oops, let's first name it. And then, and then you can enable the various you know, data sources that we support. In the case of S3, we support two tiers, standard and frozen, with different pricing points and different you know, retention and access performance. Uh, and then you can actually set the retention. For the sake of demo, we'll skip that, and we will use some of the, the po policies that we already have. Next, if you want to protect your S3 buckets, uh, what you will end up doing the first thing that you'll end up doing is to actually create what's called a, uh, the protection group. A protection group is really a combination of buckets along with the filters. This is how you're telling us what's important to you. So the way we do that, let's just name the, name the protection group. Let's call it reInvent. And then there are multiple ways that you can actually add a bucket. You can add it by tag. Let's just do by tag. 
bit more. So then what happens is that it automatically searches your environment. It automatically adds all of the buckets that contains the tag reInvent demo. And then it's not only just one time. If after the protection group is created, you create another bucket with such tag, they get automatically added. Once you can also add these buckets manually. Let's say I just pick these two. From here, now that I select this, the buckets, I need to apply the filters. The way that you apply the filters, you can actually tell us whether you want to protect all the storage classes or you want to leave some out. Maybe you're not interested in protecting some of the one zone IA. You can actually tell us whether you want to back up all the versions of the objects or just the latest version. And you can also tell us which prefixes are interesting for you. Let's say protect. And then within protect, we can exclude, let's say, the prefix junk. And we can also back up the prefix important. Next. Now that we specify the bucket and the filter, you have defined the what. Now we go ahead and select the policy that you want to apply to, whether you want to back it up every day, retain it for seven years. Now you're com uh, configuring the frequency and the retention period. So let me cancel out for the sake of demo, and then we'll just use some of the protection group that I created before the demo. I have few protection groups that I created, some of them in medium size, which is about 6 billion, some of them that are somewhat large in the order of 30 billion objects, and then we're going to concentrate in these two uh, protection groups. These two protection groups contain the two same buckets. They contain the reInvent 2022, Chromio 1, and Chromio 2, both added by tag. Over here, this protection group, the seven-year one, again, contains the exact same two buckets. And you may ask the question, why? Why do we have two protection groups for the same two buckets? The reason is that they're actually protecting different prefixes within those buckets. This one is actually protecting everything, the prefix year one, except what's under year one slash temp. And with that, we're actually applying a yearly retention because that is my compliance, that is my retention requirement. Now, if I actually go back and I look at the seven-year one, again, it is the exact same bucket. However, there are the two different prefixes. This time, I'm actually protecting the seven-year except the temp. And this time, I'm actually uh, retaining it for seven years, unlike the previous one that I was actually retaining just for one year. So that's back on the backup side of the house. Let's just you know explore the different options that we have for restore process uh, for restores. The simple one is to restore a single prefix or entire buckets. You come in and you pick the buckets that you're interested, both of them or just one of them. And then you apply filters. You tell us exactly the point in time to the second. And then moreover, you can even apply filters. And if you don't, it happens to be the entire bucket. But you can actually apply filters. And we can do things like demo. And we can even apply filter based on size. And then do a preview. So what we do, we now query the metadata engine and you will return a preview of the object that gets restored before we actually execute it. Once you click on summary, then now you are telling us where to restore it to. You're telling us whether you want to restore all the versions. It tells you about the protection group, the bucket that we selected, the filters. We can actually restore it back to the original source account, but we can actually restore it to any other registered source account. It doesn't have to be in the same account. You tell us to which bucket to restore it to. And you can also tell us what is the storage class that you want to use when we're restoring it back. From there, you can also tell us whether you want to add some prefixes in front of these objects. And we can even add some of the object tags. Another option is to actually restore a single object. It is pretty much the same. You specify the time and different filters. But the, the, chain, the difference is that you get to specify a specific version in the chain of the version that, for that object. Lastly, let me actually quickly show a uh, demo, the instant access demo. So let's just do an instant access. 
let's do reinvent uh, live. So what I'm doing here is that I'm actually creating an endpoint that contains the list of objects as of that backup on the 30th that I clicked, as of 3 p.m. 05. And if I click the endpoint, we will actually go to the instant access, and we will see the reinvent live that uh, being uh, prepared as we speak. Let me just quickly switch it over, 0%. Oh, it's actually done. OK, that was pretty quick. So it's done. So this is the, this is the live mount point, the access point that we have created. And then the way that we do it, we just copy that URL. Because again, that URL is the S3 point, S3 endpoint that contains the objects at that point in time. So let me just quickly switch it over. I'm just, I have a quick uh, cheat sheet out here uh, to help myself doing the demo. I'm just exporting a couple of environment variables. Uh, so this will be the endpoint. And then the URL that I need to copy is reinvent live copy. Copy, paste that, and that's it. Now I'm good to go. And this is the, you know, the, all the AWS CLI tool that we all love and know. So now I'm able to go ahead and do things like uh, list objects. So as you can see, we can actually list the objects. And this is basically no different than you listing the original bucket, except that we are actually listing the bucket as of is at 3 p.m. We can do things like head object. Uh, oops. Let's do that. That's the head object. You know, we can actually do head object with uh, different objects. That will work. As you can see, the E tag will actually go ahead and match this 134C, 134C. We can actually even do uh, get objects. And let me just uh, do this one out here. And oh, just to prove you, I have nothing. So that will be the get object. Now if you do an ls, we do see that object out here that we downloaded. And oops. Oh. And yeah, that's kind of the, the picture that I took about our slides. But that's the object that I put it in the three buckets, and it showed up. That's about the, the instant access. It gives you point in time immediate access to the data in the bucket. You can take it to 3 p.m., 4 p.m. We will actually give you that S3 compatible endpoint nearly instantaneously and at a fraction of the cost. Lastly, like I promised, let me just do a quick demo about the whole observability that I talked about a little earlier. So this is truly live. So what I'm going to do is what you guys see as a customer is this UI. You don't see the back end. But what we see in the back end is, again, the whole workflow engine that we manage day in, day out. So let me copy out this task ID out here. And then it is an internal debugger. It's our debugger that we implemented. Oops, I have to go to task. And then we'll have the different task IDs. And let me just fish this one out. So. This one allow us to see exactly what's going on in every single backup. We know what's happening. We're getting the, the, what we call the container information. We're setting the progresses. We're waiting for bucket configurations. We're actually doing some of the CDC queries, I mean, some of the data capture, change data captures that we talked about. This is an if step. So it's actually a little bit of a programming language that I actually put together. If this step is successful, it will take the black arrow out, and you execute the next step. If this step fails, this will turn red, and it will actually take the red arrow. And if the user cancels at that point, we will actually take the purple arrow out. This is an if statement where you have then and else. 
And this would actually be something like a, a subroutine call. I can actually click on it, and I can go deeper as to see what's happening in that subroutine. But if anything fails, this is exactly how we know where it failed, why it failed, what was the input, and what was the step that was executed before, and what did it output. And with every failure, we, this is how we can troubleshoot it within minutes and not within hours. And when something fails, we get to update that one step. That's much easier. That's why we can troubleshoot it in a matter of hours and not days. And we can actually do all this for you, and you don't have to do it. This is a light example. So let me actually give you uh, one of the a bad example that I had collected. I, in this case, I actually introduced an error intentionally, and I'll show you what it does. So as you can see, oh, it's in yellow. All right. As you can see, this is red. We know that it has failed. Where is it fail? We know that all of these steps are actually executed correctly, but it ended up failing right here. You will see the red border out there. So then, because this has failed, we're not executing the steps below it, but instead, we're actually taking the red arrow out. And then what we're doing is such as, you know, we're generating an event that something has failed. That's what the X is for. We're terminating the task as a failure. We're actually sending a notification to our support team that they know that something has failed. And we have all of the steps that has failed. And then now, because this is the subroutine that has failed with the Lambda function, we can actually click on it and look at it even deeper. This is the, uh, the function that what it does, remember, we're processing large number of uh, manifest files. So we apply the filter using multiple Lambda functions concurrently. So oops, we have what we call the fork and join step. So at this point, we compute how many Lambda functions to use. In this particular example, you're using 32 Lambdas concurrently to actually filter different areas of the manifest file to apply the filter and know what to back up and not to back up, right? So what happens is that I introduced an error on this step. That's why this turned red. But then when all these 32 lambdas are actually done processing different areas of the manifest file, they all join out here. And then they will actually continue. But it so happens that this step has failed. That's why we're actually taking the purple arrow out, that which that ends up failing. And then we bubble up to the parent workflow, which then takes the exit path to notify our support team. But looking at this, now we can actually debug things within minutes. And we can now truly be a service and take all that complexity away from you, and we own it. And what's unprecedented is they're taking on that complexity through observability, but also transparency to us as a customer. Right, and that makes a big difference in it, in it not being a black box to us so that we can understand how you're approaching the problem, too. That's it. All right. Just on time. Or maybe a little over. It's all good. <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I uh, really appreciate it. And we'll be up here if you have any questions.